Right, we are here at a day after the Tour de France. We're about 300 metres from the finish line of the final stage. I've been having a lot of requests for guests to have on the podcast, and it's always a tough thing to choose between who's a good cyclist and who's a good talker, and balancing that fine line because you get some great cyclists that aren't great talkers. I have got someone here who is an absolutely great talker, and we'll get onto his cycling ability <laughs> later and thing. But Matt, Matt Keenan, welcome to Train Like a Monk. <laughs> Thanks, Cyrus. The cycling part, maybe we'll keep that bit brief and we'll go with the talking <laughs> part more. Well, we will get to it later, but uh, the, the Palmares is, uh, is better than a lot of people probably know, and we do have something in common there. Yeah. But firstly, I, I asked you just before, but you've just been in the commentary box three weeks straight. How are you feeling? I feel blocked. You know what it's like after you travel, if you've been on a long haul flight and you get off that flight and then you've got to do your first ride? Yep. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, you, you never feel good. That's not a nice one going out the, on the road there. I felt like that for a month. So what we do is the general pattern of the day is, after breakfast, we jump in the car, we drive 30 minutes to the stage finish, yep. sit down in the commentary box, prepare notes for two hours, yep. sit down in the commentary box, commentate for six hours, leave the commentary box, sit down in the car, drive for three hours, yep. have dinner, go to bed. Right, so there's not much time to get out on the bike then? So I don't even bring a bike. Right. So there's no time to actually do much exercise, and as a result of that, travelling on the tour is why I started to do some running. And yep. I didn't enjoy running when I first started doing it, yep. but I need to do it for my head. Yeah, I okay. run for my head as much as I do run for my body. Yep. And that gives me, I run probably two days in a row, have one off. Yep. Because you know how running is so, so yeah. punishing. Yep. So throughout this tour, I've normally done two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off, and I'll run from 30 minutes to 60 minutes, yep. depending on how much time we've got to do traveling in the morning. Yep. Um, and I did a run actually yesterday with Mitch Docker, which was good. Yep. So ran with Mitch and we who, ended up running who, 10Ks. Who was putting the shoe in front of the other? Oh mate, I was half shoeing him the whole way. Uh, yep. Oh Had yeah. Covered. Oh yeah. I did see. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> I did see Mitch next door to uh, to this hotel last night, and Mitch had been uh, running up the Zwift bar table quite a bit, I think. I don't doubt door. it. He's an expert. He's pretty good after dark, Mitch. Yep. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm surprised he's been getting out for some runs with you. He ran every day. Oh, uh, yeah. Every single day during the tour. Yeah. yeah. And on the days that I don't run, I've got, I travel with TheraBands as well. Yeah. Like, as you can say, you know, like the guns <laughs> are not exactly working. Yeah. But in addition to riding my bike and going for a run, I also play tennis. Yep. So I'd had a few shoulder issues a couple of years ago and I got onto the TheraBands to just to do some light exercises, keep my shoulders active. So when I get home, I can play tennis again. Yeah. So I always have a little routine that I do with the TheraBands and a few push-ups and a couple of those bits and pieces to stay fit and healthy. Yep. Now that's really interesting because, yeah, you, I always feel for people that work in cycling that aren't the riders. We, <laughs> I notice it in teams a lot because everyone gets into cycling in some form, whether they're a swan or a mechanic or anything, because they enjoyed riding their bike at some point. Most still do enjoy riding their bikes, but the this is the biggest circus of them all, the Tour de France, and around the race itself, outside of the riders, no one has any time to actually ride a bike. Yeah, so you got a healthy lifestyle. All of us, anybody listening to this podcast has got a healthy lifestyle. Yep. Can you picture the lifestyle of a truck driver? <laughs> Yeah, you don't see too many lean looking truck drivers. Most of the people covering the Tour de France, their lifestyle is really similar to a truck driver. Yeah, okay. And you can imagine being one of the sports directors and some of them might have ridden the Tour de France five, ten times or more. Yeah. And they find themselves sitting yeah. in the car for more than nine hours a day sometimes between the race and getting to and from hotels. Yep. And then also it's the same again, I guess, as a truck driver, the food options aren't normally great. I've had some servo salads on this tour. I've had servo salads at least five times, but the servo salads here are much better yeah, than the ones say, in- Yeah, I was gonna say, the servo salads in France aren't Not bad, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you can get a tuna servo salad. It's yeah. actually all right. Yeah, that, yes, there's good options there. Um, we will go back to your riding. So you've stayed quite active now, but mm. while we're, we're close to that topic, uh, we've got one, race on our resume, on our Palmares, that is, we've both won. Do you know which race it is? Uh, and you're... actually, the person we just mentioned has also won it as well, I think. Okay. Um, well, you've been an Australian under 23 national champion. Yeah. The first year that the world championships had under 23s was in 1996. I was the first under 23 at the national championships that year. Okay. But I didn't 
it wasn't actually an award that year. It was a few years before an under 23 title was given. So I was sixth in the elite road race. Right. And I was the first under 23. I was hoping to get selected for the world championships that year. Yep. But I missed out. They selected six other people ahead of me. Okay. But I had some stiff competition. I've been there before as well. And so there was there was some guy like there was a guy Kid Eleven's got selected before <laughs> me. Uh, I think Baden Cook got selected before oh, me. They I think, haven't done much since. No, no. I think Brad McGee got selected before me. So at the time it was a bitter pill to swallow. Yep. But in reflection, absolutely they should not have picked me. They made the right <laughs> choice. Northern Suburbs three day tour? Yep, that's the one. Boom. How good is that see that on a roll? Did yeah, you have a look at that on a roll? It is very good on a roll. So if there's any juniors listening, if you want to race to target in Australia, and this is a question I get a lot, which what should I be doing to try and make it as a pro? I think once a week someone asks me, oh, what do I have to do to become a pro in Europe? There's your tour, Northern Suburbs three day tour. You know who finished second in that race? The year that you won. No, but earlier than that. Uh, I think I finished third that year. Cadell Evans finished second in it. He hasn't won it. So we've got one on Cadell. <laughs> Let's go, Cyrus. We've got Cadell covered. We've got him covered. Yep. Get a proper CV, Cadell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But you go, actually, I'll just briefly on that race. Yep. The Sansonettis used to dominate it in the 70s and they represented Australia at multiple Olympics and Commonwealth Games. Yep. And Remo and Sal Sansonetti carried the flag for Australia at the closing ceremony in 78, the Commonwealth Games. Yep. Michael Wilson. He won it as well, the first Aussie to finish top 10 in the Giro and to win a stage in the Giro. He won two stages in Grand Tours, one in the Giro, one in the Vuelta. Um, Luke Plapp might have won it, or he's been, or he's not, he's second as well, maybe. Yeah, possibly. We've got Plappy covered. Well, I think he's... Will Walker, Plappy, Mitch Docker. Yeah, Mitch Docker's won it. I think Plappy uh, was probably got a bit too good too soon to be, to be racing there. Marcel Gono, he's the guy who beat Cadell, and he went on to ride for a couple of years with Creative Agricole. Right, yeah. there we go. Good so CV, ride the Northern Suburbs three day tour. One of the better honour rolls you'll get. So then, yeah, I guess touching on that, you're someone that has the, I don't know whether it's a pleasure for you, but you get to commentate on the Australian scene domestically right down mm. to NRS level and now at the Tour de France. What is your, I guess, if you were to sum up the state of the Australian cycling scene now, because there's a lot of doom and gloom, um, I get a lot of people saying, oh, how do I get out of there? What's going on? Where, where do you think we're at with the cycling scene domestically in Australia currently? Well, the current racing in Australia is pretty weak. Yep. And there's very limited options. The National Road Series is completely disjointed. You've yep. got a race at the start of the year, you've got a race at the end of the year. So from a broadcast, from a media perspective, it's impossible to tell the story. Yep. You can't get anybody to follow the story. Yep. And somehow, despite that, Australian cycling at world tour level has probably never been in a stronger place. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's despite the National Road yeah. Series. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I would agree with that in terms of when I saw that, yeah, the National Road Series, when I first started riding it, it's easy to say the good old days, but we had a really long calendar of it. Yeah. And that was really, for me growing up, I wasn't even thinking Tour de France. I was thinking, oh, if I can just race the NRS, that looks yeah, really cool. Yeah. I get to do race all around Australia. For me, it was like the AFL football. I get to race everywhere in Australia. To me, I saw that as the top level in a way almost. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, then also with, Jerry Ryan's backing of an under 23 Australian team. That was another big thing that I thought, okay, if you can get into this yeah. team that does all this racing in Europe off based off NRS results, that's another good pathway. And then these things have sort of fallen away and I thought, okay, here goes Australian cycling, we're gonna have this massive drought. Mm. But then I think it's something that I've heard you say before, but the riders will make the way themselves if they're strong enough, if they're yeah. good enough. So at that, in that way, the, we're still seeing these amazingly talented riders come through and perform really well at the top level. And that's still happening now, even beyond they're not coming through the NRS or through that uh, under 23 pathway. But I think- Is it, is it sustainable? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing the I worry question. about. Me and too. Now there's these big jumps happening from kids that have never done anything until they get to the top level. Um, and never had a chance to dip their toe in the water and see if they really like it, mm. is the other thing. So, so what the irony is in America as well, we've got a really good generation coming through from the United States. Yep. They were real, they had a really strong domestic scene in the 90s and throughout the early 2000s. And a lot of the European teams went over there to race. Their domestic scene was on its hands and knees as well. Yep. And there's a fantastic yeah. generation. So maybe you need a really crappy national <laughs> yeah. scene. Be good. But that's but that's not the case. That's it's not. I don't think that is sustainable. Yeah. And I'm I'm hoping that the proposed Pro Velo series yep. is successful, and that we've then got a, a short national series 
that runs from you know the back end of our summer of cycling through to maybe end of March, start of April. So someone who like if you were 20 years of age again, you could do that series and then yeah. come to Europe. Yeah, and that's something because I get I help out through coaching or just through yeah. advising a lot of younger cyclists in Australia. And it's always, the question everyone has and what everyone wants to do is how do I be a pro in Europe? Yeah. What, what do I have to do to get to the Tour de France? This kind of thing. And then I guess, yeah, I've, I, I don't know. I'm sure they ask a lot of cyclists. They probably ask me because I'm not this, this super wonder kid that just stepped straight through to the top yeah. and I had to scrap away a bit to get here. But uh, my thing is always, the most simple way is to win races. So <laughs> if you're at any level yeah. you're at, you need to make sure that you're winning races, getting results, yeah. um, that stands above all else. But yeah, I guess in Australia at the moment, we're at a point where there's not many races to actually go and win. It's yeah, like and Northern, that's, that's Northern a problem. Combine three day tour, like we said. This my Lisa bike aren't looking at yeah, that result. Exactly, that's, that's the problem. So yeah. it's tricky in that regard to give young riders a direction of, yeah. okay, what do I actually have to go and win to get to this point? So I hope this, the Pro Velos Super League gets that um, a bit more exposure, the media coverage, um, and then when you have that exposure, then we can get sponsorship, then there's something in it yeah. for those sponsors, they get some return. Then for, as a rider, you can hopefully, yeah, as a rider, you can hopefully get enough to sustain it. The other problem I always face trying to, to help riders is most uh, younger riders in Australia are either studying or um, working part-time but mm. having to devote that, devote that much time to their riding they're not able to they're not earning enough money to go and travel to all these races and it's so expensive to travel around Australia to race as yeah. opposed to for the Belgian kids can drive down the road to basically any race in their country. And they can still stay at mum and dad's place. Yeah, and they exactly. can still do part-time study as well. Yeah. And they're never far from the home base. But I, do, I want to take you as an example. You kind of touched on it briefly. And David McKenzie is similar as well as somebody from my generation. Mac yeah. is a year older than me. What you do in your career and the way you race and what David McKenzie always did is you work out a way to have an impact on the race. Yeah. Even if you are not in a position to win it, you have an impact on the race. And I see a lot of a lot of other guys that are in a pro Conti team and trying to get that step up, and they ride conservatively to get as high up on the result sheet as they possibly can. But is 33rd on the result sheet going to have the same impact as spending 150Ks in the breakaway and maybe winning, but then finishing 150th? Yeah. I think the way you go about it is the right way to go about it. And that's how David McKenzie won a stage of the Giro. Yeah, and there, I do get some criticism for that. I've had criticism, especially Don't listen to it. in the in the Sun Tour, was always that because I was always flying at that time of year. Yeah. The Europeans were never going quite as well as they are for a race like the Tour, for example. So I was at the point where I could compete with them, and then I was doing being super aggressive, always going for sprint points and and that kind of thing. And a lot of people say, why do you do that when you could? Would you be at Q36.5 if you rode conservatively? No I don't chance. think you would. That, that, that's the thing. I think uh, I'm quite honest with myself. I don't believe I'm going to be able to beat any of these guys yeah. on a hilltop finish or a sprint finish. I'm not yeah. a rider that's particularly one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, and if I wait there, um, yeah, even for a reduced bunch finish, this, it's going to be really tricky for me to ever get that top result because a lot of these guys are simply more talented. And a lot of people can think, oh, that's a defeatist attitude. But the defeatist attitude would then be to sit in the bunch. Whereas for me, it's thinking, okay, how can, as you said, impact the race? So how can I get involved in this race? Impact the race in a way that for me and my team, we're starting to of Flanders, Peru Roubaix. We're not on the team, but the directors on the team bus aren't saying we need to beat Vanderpool today. They're, they're also smart enough yeah. to go, right, a top 20 result for us is great. We also want some exposure for our sponsors. Let's get involved in the race. And for me personally, the biggest piece of advice I always have is uh, to enjoy what you're doing and have fun. That's number one. I don't really enjoy sitting in the bunch the whole day. You've probably worked that out in commentary uh, right. enough. As soon as I see a start list with your name on it, I go, rightio, early breakaway, here yeah. we go. The, and then even, yeah, there was a, a few races in the classics where our team missed the break. Mm. And then it's a matter of, oh, do we just sit around and wait for these final sectors where we're gonna get bumped out of the way? 
or do we just jump on the front early on and try and impact the race in it a bit? And then, so we did that a few times as well. And you have people saying, I got this 200 Ks to go. Why was your team lined out on the front? And then in the, at the end of the day, we would put someone in the top 20 because mm. of that, yep. who no chance the riders that we were getting in the top 20 of these races uh, in the top 20 numbers wise or talent wise or results in the past. But I think that's a big thing is to, yeah, to have that exposure when you have the opportunity to. I've been lucky this team's given me the opportunity in these races to do, yeah. to race the same way I would at home in Australia in much smaller races because I enjoy doing it and it's been successful for me so far, but oh, that's Mate, it's, it's, it's working from a long time ago. You've heard of Jackie Duron, I assume? Yep. Okay, so Jackie Duron had no talent whatsoever that deserved the results that he got, but he got them because of his bravery. <laughs> yeah. He won Tour of Flanders with a 230k breakaway. Yep. The last guy to do, yeah, yeah, to do yeah. that in 92. No, that's always he won a French that. national title. He yeah. won a stage in the Tour de France. It was a pro, it was a prologue in 95 in Dunkirk and it was forecast to rain. He said, right, I'm going early. Yeah. So he went early and he won the prologue with all the superstars were crashing and in the rain. Like, he took massive risks. He could he never won a race sitting in the bunch. Yep. But he always got off and he, he, won, he won from the break. It, Stuart O'Grady, was a really good sprinter, right? He was second, I think, four times in the green jersey classification at the Tour de France. Never once won a bunch sprint. Yep. His stage wins in the Tour came from breakaways. Yep. No, and then that, I think that's Studio Grady, someone I idolised growing up as well. And then Simon Gerrans, I know you've touched on him. You, you commentate with him now, yep. but you've touched on it, on it in commentary before. He, did, he, he obviously went on to win big races from the bunch and being one of the strongest riders, but he started in his credit agricole days, I remember, at the Tour de France, you were just seeing him in breakaways. Yeah, and he'd just exactly. Getting in front, getting involved in the race, taking that confidence, getting the backing from the team because he was visible and doing these things. And so. from a training perspective, he was the perfect picture of perseverance. Yeah. Because I like, think the first Liège that he rode, he pulled out at the first feed zone. The second one he rode, he pulled out at the second <laughs> feed zone. And then the third one he finished and eventually he won it. And for Liège, based on Liège in Milan San Remo, he got himself into a winning position in both those races once and once only yeah. and executed. The rest of the time he never made it in with the leading group. Yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah, as that, that aspect of, I think a lot of people see the end goal and think, oh, that's so far away. And then mm. just taking those steps in the process to get there, getting yourself more involved and then, yeah. Yeah, focusing on those little stepping stones. But you managed to make us not talk about you for long enough now. <laughs> um, one thing, I won't make you talk about yourself too much, but the one thing that you do do, which is really close to my heart, quite literally, yeah. my father passed away from a heart attack while we was riding. You do a lot of work with a group in Melbourne, where we're both from, or from close to there. Yeah. Uh, the Baker Institute, Baker Heart Foundation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? The vacuum cleaner's gone on. Is this going to be an issue? On. No, the mics are pretty good. They won't okay, awesome. Much. So the Baker Institute has been around for more than 90 years and they do research into preventing cardiac disease. Yep. And they also do work in diabetes. So once I was lucky enough to be into in this role in a public space, you get asked a lot to do charity gigs and so on. And you can't do all of them for free that you'd like to do. Yeah. As much as you want to, you've still got limited time. Uh, so I figured I need to pick one charity that really means something to me, that resonates with me. And my grandfather and two uncles died of heart attacks in their 40s. Yeah. Um, I never met my grandfather, he died before I was born. My two uncles, both completely different lifestyles, but they died of heart attacks in their 40s. And then I had um, a fibrillation, a couple of issues, I've had an ablation with my heart to try and fix that issue. So I had to pick something that really meant something to me. And it takes more people each year than cancer. Yeah. A lot of people die of a heart attack. It's really hard to get that story out there. Because if you've got cancer, if you're getting treatment, I can have a conversation with somebody that's on chemo. Yeah. But often, like your dad, the first symptom yeah. is the last one. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it means a lot to me. I knew your dad, he was an amazing person. Yeah, I love the photo that you've got on your phone. Yeah. Um, your sister babysat our kids before the national championship one yeah. year. Uh, you've got an amazing family and it's people like you, people like your dad and for my own, complete own self-interest yep. that I'm an ambassador for that group. Yep. And I feel good about myself doing it. To, to be able to volunteer my time and do something for that group and help them with the research that they do yeah. is a real privilege. And to, yeah, so I'm involved with them 
as part of a study on the heart health of athletes. So now I'm working with them even more closely because I've had some heart problems of my own. So yeah, to work closely with them as part of a study that they're doing to actually find out more about this, hopefully prevent it happening to more people in the future, particularly athletes. I know it's something that people seem to think is more and more prevalent. Mm. I don't know if it's more prevalent or we're just... I think we're more aware. More aware. I think that's the big thing. News we're more aware travels of. quite fast now, so like yeah. you are hearing about it at every level, what's going on. So, yeah, I think... Um, this vacuum cleaner is about to suck up my shoes, you realise? Yeah, it is in a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm it's good. Is it? Oh, c'est possible just pour 10 minutes que parce que je fais un petit podcast. Ah, c'est bon. Uh, combien de temps? How long? 10, oh, 10, 10 15. Okay, okay. Oh, merci bien. <laughs> merci. Um, yeah, so the having it uh, being involved with them, especially now, there's a little bit of uncertainty with my heart as mm. well. But they're someone that have they're a group of people that. Uh, basically, yeah, looking to get the message out there that mm. this is something that we can do something about as well. Yeah, I think because there's that hopelessness of when it happens to someone, I'm sure everyone knows someone that's had a heart attack and plenty of people get a second chance or not a second chance, but they get a small heart attack and yeah. then have a chance to make some changes mm. if it's possible. A lot of the time, there might not be any changes that you can make even. Um, Amanda Spratt's dad had one recently yeah uh he's still with us fortunately yeah that was very very serious and he, i mean he's a guy who's still right he's awesome graham is amazing he's in his late 60s still rides you know 350 odd k's per week and the boxers believe that it's that base of health that has enabled him to survive it yeah yeah and that that's the the biggest thing is i think and part of what their work is that people seem to think that Uh, athletes that are pushing themselves to this level are creating more problems. The best uh, finding I've found from the research and the study I'm involved with so far is that uh, athletes by far have better health outcomes than the general public. I'm, um, take, I'm, I'm running the gauntlet of over-exercising <laughs> rather than being a couch potato. Yeah, I I'll think, take that risk. I think most listeners will probably be running that gauntlet. I've certainly had had to take a back seat a little bit more the last few months with my own issues to let the, um, yeah, I had some inflammation on the heart muscle and to let that swelling mm. go down. Um, and it is the hardest thing for any athlete to step back and, and do a little bit less. My favorite one with athletes is when a doctor says, or your physician or someone says, okay, we need you to rest. And most athletes will say, okay, how many reps is that? <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a very common one. Um, so we will get into the athlete related questions now because you asked you're an athlete yourself. Okay. We, we've talked on for a bit here. Um, I'm not very professional and like you, I write my questions here. Just well, I write them down, they end up in the hard drive. Yeah, my, I think you've I have got a good hard good, drive. My hard drive's okay, but I think you've got me covered there. The stuff that you wrote, even just off the cuff today. The I'm stuff a nerd. You're able to, to come out with. We will keep it a little bit more brief on this, okay. this side of sharp. things because no, um, the answers are fine. We'll just cut a few of the questions because okay. otherwise we'll be here forever. But uh, your favorite training session? I love doing intervals. And at the moment I'm really enjoying exploring running. And yep. I like doing, I have the session where I do five times one kilometer with 90 seconds rest in between. And I run the one kilometer pace at three minutes and 30 seconds. That's, that's moving pretty quick. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I can't string them all together. For my 50th birthday, six months away, and I want to break 18 minutes for five kilometers. Okay. I'm currently nice. tracking it around it. I can, I've, quickest is just under 18.30, yep. but I've teed up a couple of young guys in their late teens, early yeah. 20s to pace Paces. me around a track, and I'm going to buy super shoes. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a good investment. <laughs> you need the super shoes. So then what's your least favorite session? Ooh. Or do you just... I don't have I don't have unfavorite sessions. I guess you've probably got you know the benefit I, now if you don't have to go out there and do some. I don't have to do much. super. I don't do super long. Yeah. Okay. You know, the, my least favorite session with trying to live as long as possible and as healthy as possible with these massive guns of mine. Yeah. I've bought a home gym. Yep. And I'm trying to do some weights. Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to, and I actually don't really enjoy it because I'm yep. pathetic. That, that's interesting. It is common among cyclists, and that's one of the questions. So you've killed two birds. There is uh, what what kind of cross training that you do, but it's quite common, I think, 
endurance athletes, which the majority of the listeners will be, uh, aren't, don't tend to be fans of jumping in the gym. Yeah, um, I don't. I think it's yeah. probably because we're all outdoors people. Yeah. Um, if, and you, then, if you tried that, you've done the dead hang, try to do the dead hang for two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, that sounds easy, yeah? Yeah, it does sound easy. Oh, it's not. No. Try it. Dead hang off a chin up bar for two minutes. Yeah, grip Let strength. Let Cyrus know how you go. Grip strength isn't the, the strong point of most cyclists. Can uh, I jump the gun then and go with some cross training? Yep. I play tennis twice a week. Yep. So the beauty of that is you don't have your phone on you, yep. which you do when you're running or you're riding. Yep. So you, you, know, you hear it buzz. Yeah, or something. okay. And you're not thinking about the phone call that you need to return or the email you need to do, because you just want to get that damn ball back over the other side of the net. And it also, like the sideways movement, which as cyclists and runners we mm. never do, sideways movement is good. Yep. And trying to have that coordination between hand-eye coordination, your brain and physical activity, and you're completely distracted from anything else in life and just focused on that moment. Yeah, I, I think, find that really good. Yeah, no, I can, can understand that. It is interesting because cyclists and ball sports usually aren't a big mix, but I'm definitely in the same thing. That's something I'm looking forward to doing more of. When Did I'm you play as a kid? Uh, tennis, a little bit, but I'm talking more cricket. Okay, I played nice. lots of um, yeah. golf as well, but just anything with a bit of coordination. Yeah. I, yeah, I like that aspect of just the full concentration on one thing at yeah. the time while you're doing it. You're really in the moment. Yep. Whereas sometimes if you're going for a, you know, a zone out endurance ride or run, your mind can drift into the work commitments that you've got later on in the day. And it doesn't happen when you're playing a ball sport. Yeah. Uh, next one, favorite training loop. Our favorite training loop from home, I have a training loop that goes from, I live in Heidelberg yep. and go out through Diamond Creek Yep. Go out through Nutfield, into Arthur's Creek, down to the base of King Lake, up King Lake, and if I'm really fit, I can go back down through Yarra Glen and through the Christmas Hills and home. Yep. But I'm not quite fit <laughs> enough to do that at the moment. So that's my favourite loop from home. My favourite place to ride is Bright. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no surprises there. And my yep. favourite climb is Mount Buffalo. Okay, yep. No, I, I really love Mount Buffalo as well, so I can... You can relate. I can definitely relate to those two. And then also I was living in Heidelberg for a while and then while I was studying not far from there and that was my go-to. It's a good loop, isn't it? Well. Through Nutfield and yep. through the Apple Orchards. Yeah, yeah, and you're just out of the city, no one around you to bother you. Yeah, yeah. That, it doesn't doesn't feel like you're close to Melbourne at all and it's, yeah, yeah it's really nice. Uh, when you are training, are you someone that prefers to ride with a group or solo rides? I have seen you on the Peaks Bunch a few times. Uh, I pref on the road, group, Yep. gravel ride solo. Yeah, okay. Even though the, it, I guess with the gravel rides, there's more chance of stuff going wrong and having people around might be handy, or you like running the gauntlet a bit? You want to touch wood when... Cyrus, <laughs> 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 you put the moss on me, come on, man. <laughs> well, it's, it's just, I'm talking punctures, not, not anything. Okay, punctures, good, 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 good. Yeah, no, I can, I worked in a bike shop when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Yeah, so you've I was, got to, you can MacGyver can, your way out of it. I can look situation. after it. Yeah, I can take it. Yeah, I, for safety reasons, I like riding in a group on the road. And it's great socially to catch up with, with friends. But on the, I like the peace and quiet of doing a gravel ride on my own. Yep, uh, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, and then, are you someone that, when, let's say it's raining now, are you, what's your go-to when the weather's rubbish? Do you jump on the trainer? Do you go out in the rain? Or do you put the running shoes on? I will run in the rain. Yep. I won't start a ride in the rain. Okay. But I can deal with it if it starts raining when I'm out there. Yep. I do cheat. I've got the Zwift set up in the garage. Yep. Um, or now I'm trying, and it's only been going for six months, I've been trying to use the gym. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I would recommend sticking to it, even if you're not enjoying it that much, because the, the research out there just shows in terms of longevity. Oh, all the research tells me I'm doing the right thing, yeah, but I've exactly. just got to get my head around it. Yeah, no, you've got to stick to it. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll go now to the last piece. Um, what is, you've had a lot of sound pieces of advice so far, but what yeah. would be your best piece of advice that you would give to, I'm sure there's plenty of young cyclists listening. It might not be something too specifically bike related, okay. but. Well, mine is, my uh, piece of advice that I heard, uh, there's a couple, can I have a couple? Yeah, you can, I'll, I'll allow it. Oh yeah, a minimum of two. So the first one was from my old cycling coach, Jimmy Pritchard, who's no longer with us, but was an amazing person. When I was upset in 96, we thought I should have been a chance to get selected for the world. I was moping around for a week and he said, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% what you do about it. What are you gonna do about it? 
Yeah. Thought that was a really good piece of advice. Yeah, that's great. Another one, when you're in a public role like I am, plenty of people want to give you free advice and it's normally criticism when they're trying to give you free advice. And I saw a quote from Morgan Freeman, which was, don't take criticism from anybody you wouldn't take advice I from. I love that one. And I, I love giving that to people as well. Maybe maybe they don't take that advice because well, <laughs> because they're not listening to me. But, uh, <laughs> but isn't that good advice? I love that one. And that's something that, yeah, you're in the public eye more than about anyone, I guess. And that's something that I, I struggled with it for a little bit as I became a little bit more prominent because yeah. you don't, the, the more people there are out there that find your stuff and like it, there's also gonna be that same percentage regardless of what the, mm. how it's spread of people that don't like what you're doing and they'll be leaving negative stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, giving criticism, that kind of stuff. And then, yeah. And I don't want those outside voices to influence how I feel about me, whether yep. it's positive or negative. Yep. So I don't want to get an inflated ego by reading the positives. And yep. I don't want to get a deflated ego by reading the negatives. Yep. I'll seek feedback from people whose opinion I really value. Yep. And it's a consolidated piece of feedback it's like the whole piece as opposed to one or two mistakes that you make and you make mistakes every single day. Yeah. We all, the only people who don't make mistakes are the people who aren't trying to achieve anything. Yeah. And the, you know, the other element with people, how many successful people do you know spend their time leaving negative comments on social media posts? <laughs> yeah. I don't know any. <laughs> None of them are successful. None of the people that I value having in my life are leaving negative comments on social media. Yeah. No, I think that's just great advice and then also, yeah, just devoting that time then to the people that you actually care about. Yeah. Um, and then I think... And sorry, one more to pick up on you, the have fun element. Yeah. You gotta keep having fun in life. Yeah. Because I, you know, I was, you know, as a kid, I dreamt of riding the Tour de France. I wasn't anywhere near being good enough, but I've now been able to commentate on the tour 18 times. Yeah. And I've followed my passion and it's led me down a path where I've been able to generate an income. And doing this definitely was not a career choice yeah. when I was doing work experience in year 10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So just on have fun, we'll finish off, off with this one. You're here in Nice now, you've been uh, in comms the whole time. Do you actually get a chance to enjoy it and go out here and explore Nice? I've taken up half an hour of your time this well, morning. Well, I'm going to lunch to explore Nice, but I yeah. used to, before COVID, I worked for ASO. So I did the world feed for the commentary yep. and SBS happened to pick that up. So I did Paris Nice every year from 2007 through to 2020 yep. and would always finish in Nice. So I'd start the last day on the Sunday by having to walk down the past where the, the promenade or, yep. the, the, or the other little side street that's the other side of it. Yep. And there'd be all the, the markets. markets there, the fresh food and sit there and have a coffee and so on. Yep. So I'm going to head down there shortly for lunch. Beautiful. Well, I'm sure you'll really enjoy that. Uh, Matt Keenan, thanks so much for coming on. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Hope we didn't talk talk your ears off too much because we, we are quite good talkers and Matt, <laughs> Matt is the best of them. But thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your time in Nice and enjoy your trip back to Oz. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Thanks.